and a warm welcome to the Metrian Iron Channels and Drug Discovery webinar series. My name is Sophie Rose, Sales and Marketing Manager here at Metrian Biosciences. And so today's webinar is going to be presented by Professor David Shepherd from the University of Bristol. And David will present Cystic Fibrosis, Rescuing Faulty Channels with Targeted Therapies. So we also just wanted to alert the audience to our up and coming webinar. And um, this is going to be scheduled for Thursday, the 3rd of February, 2022 at 4 p.m. Um, registrations will open tomorrow and the talk will be presented by Dr. Greg Carr, who comes from the Lieber Institute for Brain Development. Greg's talk will be entitled A Role for Herg Potassium Channels in Cognitive Function. So now we have a few more attendees. I'm just going to start a little bit of housekeeping. So we just wanted to summarise how to ask a question during the presentation. Um, so it's just for those unfamiliar with GoToWebinar who might not have used the software before. So participants are muted during the webinar. So to engage with us, please submit any technical queries via the chat box. So for example, if suddenly the sound goes or you can't see something or you can't hear something correctly, then please do let us know and we'll try and address that as quickly as possible. Um, to pose questions for David, this is really important. We love to have questions, so please feel free to have uh, to, to to answer uh, to ask as many as you like, and we'll try and cover as many of them as we can. Um, please do this by the question pane, which is on the control panel. Um, instructions should appear on the screen uh, now as to how to use that. And all questions will be answered after the talk during the question and answer session, which will be hosted by my colleague Dr. Eddie Stevens. So just a quick summary for those of you who may not be familiar with Metrian. So we're a preclinical CRO. Uh, we're located at Granter Park in Cambridge, UK, and we specialise in iron channel focused drug discovery and safety pharmacology screening services. So we've recently moved into a brand new 12,000 square foot custom designed laboratory and office premises to allow us to expand our service offering. We have a broad selection of electrophysiology platforms here at Metrian, including manual and automated patch clamp platforms, including multiple Q patches and patch liners, in addition to the Cube, which offers high throughput screening capabilities. So we offer specialist ion channel uh, services. Uh, this includes high quality ion channel assays on a fee for service or an FTE basis, an industry leading panel of in vitro cardiac ion channel safety assays, translational native cell and phenotypic assays for neurological and cardiotoxicity testing. And we also offer cell line development and optimization services. So I'm pleased to say we are actively recruiting here at, uh, at Grant Park at Metrian. Um, so please do keep an eye on our website and also on our social media pages if you're seeking employment and this may be of interest to you. Um, finally, some of our, uh, our eagle-eyed viewers and our keen followers uh, may have seen our press release today. Uh, which announces the appointment of Dr. Rory Curtis, hired as VP of US Commercial Operations. Uh, Rory's been hired to support Metrian's growth aspirations in the US. And, uh, you know, we offer a, a warm welcome to Rory. So I'm now going to introduce my colleague, Eddie. Um, so Eddie Stevens is our Head of Drug Discovery here at Metrian. And Eddie will now provide a brief introduction. Okay, great. Well, um, good, good afternoon, everybody. So, yeah, we're really delighted to introduce um, David Shepherd. And uh, so he's Professor of Physiology at the University of Bristol. And um, his research focuses on um, CFTR, the cystic fibrosis transmembrane conduction, re conductance regulator. It's a pretty, that's a big mouthful, so CFTR is a better name. And, it, and it's um, dysfunction in cystic fibrosis and rescue with small molecules. So David's interest in CF began during his PhD when he, when he investigated intestinal ion channels with um, Francisco Sepulveda um, at the Babraham Institute in, in Cambridge. And after that, um, he went on to investigate neuronal ion channels with um, Fernando Giraldes at um, Valladolid University. And then he went on to study CFTR with Michael Welsh at the University of Iowa. On returning to the UK, he um, went on to, um, as a BBSRC advanced research fellow, he went on to um, study CFTR at um, the University of Edinburgh before joining the University of Bristol. And actually from his time since the 1990s at, um, at Edinburgh, he's been um, onwards, he's been funded by the, mainly funded by the CF Trust. And he's done some great stuff like um, lead the Eurocare CF program as well. 
so um so yeah so so welcome david and um yeah when you're ready um yeah, you, um feel free to start just really like to say uh, a, a huge thank you to uh eddie for the the kind invitation to to speak to you today um and i also need to sort of say uh uh, thank you very much to Sophie and her colleague Nick for for helping me uh, uh, navigate through through this uh, system. So today I, I would really like to to discuss with you uh, targeted therapies for cystic fibrosis. And so these targeted therapies they treat the root cause of disease in cystic fibrosis, and they are transforming the care uh, of of this of of individuals living with this disease. Uh, and these therapies now are available for something like 90% of individuals living with cystic fibrosis. So I, I, I need to, so before going any further, I really want to sort of say a huge thank you to my wonderful colleagues at the University of Bristol. So my current colleagues uh, at the top on the, on the, uh, on the top on the on the left here uh, and uh, former colleagues uh, uh, below them uh, and so today i'm going to discuss some work that was undertaken by uh, uh, Jia or Tina Lu uh, and Yi Ting Caroline Wang uh, together with my uh, uh, long-standing former colleague Ji Wei Kai and what we what we do is we collaborate with a variety of different groups uh, and you know it's a, it's very much a collaborative effort uh, uh, working to help develop new therapies for cystic fibrosis and so today we'll talk a little bit about some work that was undertaken with Bo with Bob Ford at the University of Manchester and then I really would like to sort of say uh, you know a, a, it was a special privilege to be able to sort of work together with Eddie and his colleagues Li Shuang and Alison and Marco uh, when they were part of, of Pfizer uh, and, uh, on this um, CFDR potentiator. Finally uh, Walilak was a, a PhD student who, from um, Maldon University in Thailand and she visited us for a year and contributed to these studies. So the presentation then is, is divided into to two parts. Uh, first of all, I, I'd like to talk about uh, targeted therapies for the most common cause of cystic fibrosis, and that's the F508-DEL uh, uh, variant in the cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator. And then we'll follow that with the, the discussion of the, the work undertaken with Eddie and his colleagues on, on a new CFDR potentiator and using it in conjunction with IVACAFTA to boost further channel activity. So I'd like to share this slide with you at the, at the start. Um, and so um, this slide was, was shared um, by Francis Collins, the director of the National Institutes of Health, um, when he attended uh, the North American Cystic Fibrosis Conference in October 2019. Uh, and this is from uh, Jenny. So Jenny lives with cystic fibrosis, and and this was what uh, the message at the bottom was was the uh, was what she had recently communicated to to Francis. Uh, but back in 1989, when um, when the gene was first identified, Jenny wrote this diary entry shown on the left. Today is the most best day ever ever in my life they found a gene for cystic fibrosis so jenny stayed healthy she she lives in colorado she writes children's books and she has a young child pippa lou uh, and so the reason why uh, jenny was contacting francis at that time and the what reason why francis was at the north american cystic fibrosis conference in in october 2019 was the approval by the, the us food and drug administration the fda of a new therapy for cystic fibrosis and this is a triple drug combination alexicafter tezicafter ivacafter so three oral pills and this triple drug combination is transforming the, the lives of individuals living with cystic fibrosis. This therapy it provides a therapy for the root cause of disease for 90% of individuals living with cystic fibrosis. So what you see here are the phase three clinical trial data of Alexicafter, Tezicafter, Ivacafter, or ETI for short. So you have two groups of individuals with the F508-DEL mutation. One group is the placebo, 
oil, and the other group is given the, uh, the, the active compounds, ETI. And on the x-axis, you've got time in weeks, and on the y-axis, you've got forced expiratory volume in one second, a blunt measure of lung function. And the placebo, uh, you don't see any change in FEV1 over the duration of the trial, but immediately the individuals taking ETI start the drug therapy, you see a 14% improvement in lung function that is then sustained for the duration of the clinical trial. So this is a transformational therapy. Um, in going to cystic fibrosis conferences uh, for more years than I can remember, or that uh, until uh, Ivacaftor on its own was approved as a therapy for, for, for a small group of variants, we never saw improvements in lung function of this magnitude. So Alexicaftor, Tezacaftor, Ivacaftor, and other therapies like Ivacaftor on its own are transforming the care of individuals with cystic fibrosis. But to get to this point, we've got to go back to 1989, when uh, there were three back-to-back -back articles published in, in Science, and those uh, articles, they announced the identification and cloning of the defective gene responsible for cystic fibrosis. And so this was a huge team effort, and it took uh, the, the group led by Francis Collins at the University of Michigan, and the, the group uh, led by Jack Reardon and Lapchi Choi at the Hospital for Sick Children, working collaboratively. So it was, a, it was an army of researchers working for the entire duration of the 1980s to identify the defective gene responsible for cystic fibrosis. But this was the bottleneck moment for the cystic fibrosis field. So with the gene identified, the, the field passed through a bottleneck, and now it was possible to understand uh, the normal function of the protein product of this gene. It was possible to understand how variants that cause disease cause a loss of function of this protein at the level of single molecules, at the level of cells, tissues, and whole animal models of disease. And so very soon, uh, uh, almost immediately, J uh, Jack Reardon uh, had a predicted structure of, of the, the protein product of the gene defective in cystic fibrosis, and he recognized that it was composed of five domains. So here on the left, uh, shown in blue, is the lipid bilayer, and then there's two domains uh, called transmembrane domains, or you might hear me refer to them as membrane-spanning domains, as, as uh, Jack first referred to them, and they're each containing six transmembrane segments. CFDR also contains two domains that are referred to as nucleotide binding domains. And Jack realized that these parts of the protein contained amino acid sequences known to interact with ATP in other proteins. But CFDR contained a, a fifth domain, and that fifth domain was a unique feature of CFDR, and it's been given the, the name the regulatory or R domain. The R domain is a unique feature. It contains, because it contains many charged amino acids and consensus phosphorylation sites. So the fact that CFTR had two transmembrane domains and two nucleotide binding domains, that put CFTR in a family of proteins called ATP binding cassette transporters. This is a very large family of transporters found from bacteria through plants and, 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 to, and animals to, to humans. And they transport, they utilize the energy of ATP binding and hydrolysis to pump diverse substrates across cell membranes. They don't form uh, ion channels. And so when uh, CFDR was shown to be an ABC transporter, the expectation was that it was a channel regulator. But very soon after it was identified in 1991, Mike Welsh's group demonstrated for the first time that CFTR is a regulated chloride channel, quickly followed by work from Jack Reardon and, and Christine Baer, uh, studying purified reconstituted CFTR. Now, we've waited an awful long time for a high-resolution, an atomic-resolution structure of CFTR, and it required advances in cryo-electron microscopy. But in, the, in December 2016, uh, Ju Chen and her colleagues at Rockefeller University first published this structure. And so this is uh, the closed, uh, sorry, I should say, this is the 
dephosphorylated ATP-free configuration of CFTR. And you see it in an inverted V formation. And so this inverted V with the transmembrane segments coming together towards the outside of the protein, uh, the transmembrane segments here are closed and the nucleotide binding domains are separated. They're far apart and they're separated by the regulatory domain. So to understand how CFTR works uh, as a regulated chloride channel, we need to, uh, we need to integrate uh, uh, the functional studies using high resolution single channel recording, such as those that you see at the bottom of this slide with, the, with structural studies uh, that in the sort of late 90s and early 2000s were undertaken on related bacterial ABC transporters, and then the biochemical studies. And many of those biochemical studies were undertaken by, by Jack Reardon. And so it was realized that in the case of CFTR, there's two ATP binding sites that are located at the interface of the nucleotide binding domains. But these ATP binding sites have distinct properties. So one site is a site of stable ATP binding. By contrast, the other site is a site of rapid ATP hydrolysis. And so it's the interaction of ATP with these two binding sites, uh, these ATP binding sites at the interface of the nucleotide binding domains that drives cycles of ATP binding and hydrolysis. So once the R domain is is phosphorylated, it moves out of the way and ATP will then bind at, the, at its two ATP binding sites at the interface of the MBDs. And the MBDs go from this open configuration where the transmembrane domains uh, are closed uh, to uh, a form uh, a dimer where the MBDs have come together and they're glued together by ATP. So this change in shape of the, the nucleotide binding domains going from an open configuration to a closed configuration transmits signals to the membrane spanning domains and they go from a closed configuration where chloride can't cross the cell membrane to an open configuration where now chloride can stream across the, the cell membrane. So that's the channel going from a closed configuration to an open configuration. Now for the open channel to close, it's a case of ATP hydrolysis at this second ATP binding site, driving separation of the two nucleotide binding domains. So when, the, so when we study CFTR channel gating, using single channel recording when we see channels chattering from the closed configuration to the open configuration and back to the closed configuration what what we're seeing uh, is is the electrical uh, signal of ions passing through cfdr but that is those those conformational changes uh, in, in the channel are being driven by cycles of atp binding and hydrolysis at the nucleotide binding domains. So ATP binding and hydrolysis acting as a timing mechanism to control channel opening and closing. So if we want to understand uh, cystic fibrosis, we need to sort of characterize how variants uh, cause a loss of function. Uh, and uh, the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto uh, maintains a database of cystic fibrosis variants. And the numbers of variants have grown and grown and grown. And now there's more than 2,000 variants in the CFTR gene. And they're located throughout the, the five domains of CFTR. Many, many of these variants are extremely rare and found in a sort of handful of cases worldwide. But the reason why uh, cystic fibrosis is a relatively common uh, single gene disorder is the presence of one variant. And that variant is called F508-DEL. It's an in-frame deletion of a phenylalanine, the F at position 508. So the entire protein is made, but F is missing. So we want to understand how F508-DEL and other variants cause a loss of CFDR function. So to do that, we need not only uh, functional studies, but we need to know their effects on, 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 the, on the, how CFDR is made and delivered to the cell surface. So CFDR is made in the endoplasmic reticulum where it's core glycosylated. This immature form of the protein is then moved to the Golgi apparatus 
where, where a further glycosylation takes place to form the mature protein. And that mature protein is delivered to the apical or lumen facing membrane of ducts and tubes throughout the body. Now, the first evidence that, that CFTR is delivered to the cell surface or, or that, is, that has sugars added to it, uh, that is indicative of being processed through the Golgi, whereas the F508 del mutation uh, is, is missing uh, those complex sugars uh, and fails to mature, was undertaken by Seng Cheng and Alan Smith at Genzyme. And so they took tissue culture cells uh, that don't express CFTR and don't have cyclic AMP stimulated chloride currents, and they expressed either the wild type form of CFTR shown on the left or F508 DEL in those cells. And then they performed uh, immunoprecipitation. Uh, and when they did, they saw three bands. So band A for wild type CFDR represents the immature, uh, re represents the unglycosylated form of the protein. Band B is the immature core glycosylated form of the protein. And then this large diffusely migrating band, that's band C, the mature form of the protein. When they did the same experiment for F508 DEL, then the mature form of the protein, band C, is missing. So Seng Cheng and Alan Smith interpreted this result to, to say that F508 DEL is, is misfolded uh, and it's retained in the cell uh, and degraded. Uh, so it's going to be um, retained in the endoplasmic reticulum, uh, ubiquitinated and targeted for degradation it, because it lacks those complex sugars. The complex sugars band C are indicative of the maturation of wild type CFTR. So first and foremost, uh, the reason why F508 DEL uh, causes, uh, causes cystic fibrosis is that, that, the, that it's missing from its correct cellular location, the apical membrane of epithelia. But if you grow cells expressing F508 DEL at low temperature, then the protein can fold and then it can traffic to the Golgi apparatus and the apical membrane or, or, or uh, in the cell membrane in the case of tissue culture cells, where we can then study its activity. So here shows you at the top uh, 20 seconds of, of data for wild type CFDR. And these recordings were made using the excised inside out configuration of the patch clamp technique. So the dotted line shows you where channels are closed, downward deflections of the trace correspond to channel opening. And so that's gonna to correspond to chloride moving from the intracellular side of the membrane, in this case, through one open channel into the extracellular side of the membrane, which is, bathed, which is within the patch pipette. So in order to magnify the small size of these, these openings that are typically less than one picoamp, uh, we, we use a large chloride concentration gradient and we clamp voltage at minus 50 millivolts. And in order to sustain CFDR activity, we always have ATP and PKA within our recording solutions. And wherever possible, we like to work at 37 degrees. So it, it, for t over 20 seconds of data, you see that wild type chatters open and close on a very regular basis. By contrast, when you low temperature rescue F508 DEL and you deliver it to the cell surface, you see a very different pattern of, of channel activity. So the channel is closed for much longer, the open, then it opens, but it then closes again. So we see uh, openings that are of the same magnitude as wild type CFDR, but the closures between one opening and the next opening. So if you compare these short uh, long closures with these very long, long closures, you see that it's much harder to open the F508 DEL channel. When we record F508 DEL for longer periods, then we start to see these smaller openings and those smaller openings uh, at 37 degrees C are indicative of uh, an unstable channel. So to quantify these data, we're gonna measure the current that flows through an individual channel, the size of the downward deflection. We're gonna measure open probability. And if we look at this four second uh, segment of, of, of recording here, to measure open probability, a measure of the average fraction of time a channel is open, we're gonna measure this open duration and then add this open duration, this, this open duration, that open duration, and finally that open duration, and divide by the total duration of the recording. If we have more than one channel in the membrane patch, the calculation gets a little bit more complicated, but open probability gives us a measure of channel activity. 
To further understand how channels open and close, we measure the average duration of channel openings, that's referred to as mean burst duration, and the average duration of the long closures between one channel opening and the next channel opening, and that's called the interburst interval. The interburst interval. So if we quantify the data here, shows shown on the left, at beginnings of, of recordings of F508 Dell, the size of the openings are the same as wild type. So there's no difference in current flow through an open channel. But you can see that the open probability uh, of that full open state is extremely low compared to that of, of wild type CFDR. So we've got a severe defect in channel gating. And the reason for this severe defect in channel gating is the great prolongation of the, the of the interburst interval, the duration of long closures between one opening and the next opening. By contrast, the duration of the openings are almost the same uh, for F508 Dell as wild type CFTR. So it's as if uh, F508 Dell has a sticky gate, and that sticky gate is much harder to open compared to wild type CFTR. So. Uh, to summarize then, low temperature rescued F508 Dell, severe gating defect, which greatly slows channel opening, 37 degrees C, these low temperature rescued channels are unstable, and that's characterized by opening to a subconductant state. So when we get the protein to the cell surface, we see a defect in channel regulation. So I've already uh, hinted that, that F508 Dell is unstable at 37 degrees C, and this is, uh, uh, this is sort of more clearly demonstrated in these time courses here. So what we're looking at is open probability measurements on the, on the y-axis against time on the x-axis, and we've got about 10 minutes of, just under 10 minutes of data. So if we study wild type at 37 degrees C, and each bar is 30 seconds of open probability data, open probability is, is constant in the presence of ATP and pKa. If we study F508 Dell at 23 degrees C, the open probability values are much, much lower, but, they, but the channel remains active for at least uh, 10 minutes. By contrast, if we study F508 Dell at 37 degrees C, we have a very limited window when we study channel activity. So we have channel activity for something like three or four minutes, but by the time we've got to about six minutes, we've lost activity of F508 Dell uh, channels. So we have a uh, so. This makes studying F508 Dell particularly challenging. So to summarize then, uh, at, low at 37 degrees C, uh, low temperature rescued F508 Dell is unstable, it deactivates or it runs down. And that deactivation involves not just changes in channel gating, but also current flow through open channels, evident by that the presence of a subconductant state. And F508 Dell deactivation, this, is, this reflects instability of channel structure. And the reason we say that is that if we introduce uh, revertent mutations or second site mutations into F508 Dell, then we can rescue uh, the, the stability of F508 Dell at physiological temperatures. So F508 Dell then has multiple mechanisms of CFTR dysfunction. First and foremost, defective maturation, de defective delivery to the cell surface. But if we get the protein to the cell surface, then it's very unstable. And in addition, it's got a gating defect. And what we're finding now, as, as we characterize more and more cystic fibrosis variants, that this multiple mechanisms of, of dysfunction is, is the norm. It's not the exception. It is very much the norm. Uh, the gating mutations such as G551D that I'll, that I'll talk about in the second part of the presentation, where you have just a single defect, ch defective channel gating, no effect on stability or, or processing, that is the exception. Very few variants have just a single mechanism of dysfunction. Now, if we want to repair or if we want targeted therapies that, that, that will optimally rescue F508 Dell and many variants, then we need combinations of two types of drugs. We need correctors, and so correctors uh, allow the F508 Dell to fold in the endoplasmic reticulum and then be delivered to the Golgi and the cell surface. So in the case of uh, Alexicafter, Tezicafter, Ivacafter, Alexicafter and Tezicafter are correctors, and, what, and they deliver the protein to the cell surface, and then Ivacafter is a potentiator. It's not an opener. We need to phosphorylate CFDR first, uh, and, and then in the presence of phosphorylated CFDR, Ivacafter will enhance greatly channel 
activity. And it will do that for ATP dependent or ATP de independent channel gating. Now, sorry. So we know uh, that the, the sites of interaction, the, 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 there are several different uh, types of, of correctors. So uh, Tezacafter and its predecessor, Lumacafter, these interact at the level of the, of the nucleotide, uh, sorry, the, the interface between the membrane spanning domains and the nucleotide binding domain. So that's class one, and Tezacafter is the best example of that. Then we have class two correctors. Uh, an example of that is core 4A, and that's an investigational corrector, the first corrector identified by Alan Verkman and his colleagues. And then finally, uh, what is very exciting is that Alexicafter is a, is a, is a class 3 corrector, and it targets MBD1, the site of the F508 del mutation. So the combination of Alexicafter and Tezicafter, Alexicafter allowing MBD1 to fold, and then the combination of the two correctors allows the domains to assemble correctly so you so that when you have correct domain domain assembly then the protein is delivered to the cell surface so to summarize then cftr is an anion channel with complex regulation f508 del and many other variants they have they have they they have multiple mechanisms of dysfunction disrupting expression stability and function and so we need combinations therapy uh, combinations of correctors and potentiators to optimally rescue channel activity so in the second part of the presentation, I'd like to talk about the, the studies that we helped uh, Eddie and his, and his colleagues with uh, uh, characterizing a new CFTR potentiator identified uh, by, by Pfizer. And so uh, what we've got on the, on the left-hand side of the slide are the two chemical structures. And so at the bottom left, you can see the chemical structure of, of Ivacafter, and above it, you have the chemical structure of this compound CP628006. And I'm afraid that this is just too much of a mouthful. So for the remainder of the talk, please bear with me while I refer to this as CP. Now, what was quite striking was that CP uh, had a distinct structure to that of Ivacafter and many other uh, potentiators that have been identified either by investigator-led studies or by high throughput screening. And so uh, CP was identified in a, in a screen of something like 150,000 uh, uh, chemical entities. So after it was identified, the next uh, step was to, was to use the Ussing chamber technique to, to study um, how the potentiator affected CFTR-mediated ion transport across polarized epithelium. And so those studies were undertaken with, uh, with first of all, Fisher rat thyroid epithelium. And so the advantage of using FRT epithelia is that they don't normally express CFDR. And so they've been used as a model system to express either wild type or, or CFDR variants like F508 del and G551D. And then I'm not going to show you the data, but they also uh, uh, studied uh, human bronchial epithelia uh, with, from individuals with cystic fibrosis and either F508 del or the G551D uh, variant. And they saw similar results. So what you see uh, in the bottom right are the, the summary data. So these are concentration response relationships. So on the x-axis, drug concentration, and on the y-axis, we've got the Ussing chamber data uh, measure uh, the potentiation of, of, of CFDR-mediated uh, recordings uh, expressed as a percent of the, of the maximal Ivacafter uh, concentration. And so for both F508 del and G551D, we see that the, the CP data is shifted to the right uh, and that there is a lower uh, maximal effect compared to that of, of Ivacafter. And so in the case of uh, uh, G551D, uh, for Ivacafter, uh, we, uh, we, we see uh, the, uh, uh, the EC50 of 0 0.03 compared to 1.68 uh, for CP, and it's a maximal effect around 100% compared to about 40%. 
So these encouraging results then led Eddie uh, to, and Li Shuang to, and, and, and to go on and, and study how CP stimulates uh, or potentiates uh, CFDR channel uh, gating. Uh, and those studies were then undertaken by, by Tina, first of all uh, at Pfizer, and then later here in, at Bristol. And so just to so summarize then, uh, high foot throughput screening, 150,000 compounds identified uh, CP628006, chemical structure distinct from known CFDR potentiators, and it efficaciously, efficaciously potentiated uh, F508 DEL and G551D either in FRT epithelia and human bronchial epithelia. So let's come back to Tina studies, uh, and now what she's using is the excised inside out configuration of the patch clamp technique, and she's using low temperature rescued F508 DEL CFDR channels, and these studies are un undertaken at room temperature, not 37 degrees C, but you see uh, similar uh, effects at, at the two temperatures. So on the left, we have increasing concentrations of Ivacafter, and on the right, increasing concentrations of, of the CP compound, and you see that both potentiators, they increase the frequency and duration of, of channel uh, uh, openings. So those to quantify those data, uh, Tina began by, by measuring open probability. And so here you, you have the wild type data shown on the, on the, on the left, the F508 DEL data shown in the middle, and the G551D data shown on the right. And for, for wild type and for F508 DEL, uh, Tina measured open probability against drug concentration. But in the case of G551D, she's measuring apparent open probability. And the reason she measures apparent open probability and not open probability is that G551D is a profoundly defective channel. And so when we study G551D, it's extremely difficult to know how many channels we have in a membrane patch. And so for that reason, we, 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 we call it apparent open probability, not open probability. And so in each case, uh, C, the, the CP compound, the, the, uh, the concentration response relationship is shifted to the, to the right uh, for wild type and, uh, and F508DEL. They're closer together for G551D. But what was interesting in the case of excised inside out membrane patches, now we see that the, that the CP compound is, is, is as good as, as, as Ivacafter or, in, uh, or if not a bit, uh, a bit better. And so our EC50 and, and, and maximal effect values for F508 DEL, for example, uh, uh, 0 0.08 uh, micromole compared to 0 0.5 micromole, 103 compared to 144. So, so we have a, an efficacious uh, potentiator uh, that, that, okay, it's got a, a lower uh, EC50 compared to Ivacafta, but here we're comparing a, a screening hit versus a, a, a clinically used drug. So to summarize then, it, uh, the drug uh, eats, uh, CP then enhances channel activity by increasing the frequency and duration of channel openings. It restores wild type levels of channel activity to F508 DEL. I, I didn't emphasize that. So you can see that your open probability values here are equivalent uh, to those in the absence of the, of the CP compact. They, we don't see restoration of, of wild type levels of channel activity to G551D by either Ivacafter or, C, uh, or, or the CP compact. The, the open probability values here are much, much lower than those of F508 DEL and wild type CFDR. So CP then restores wild type levels of channel activity, F508 DEL. It increases the activity of G551D, but it doesn't reach wild type levels. And so we would conclude based on the Ussing chamber data and the single channel data that CP628006 is an efficacious CFDR potentiator. So we want to know how uh, CP uh, enhances uh, CFDR activity. And so what uh, Tina uh, next started to do was to look at the at ATP dependent channel gating for both wild type CFDR, F508 DEL, uh, and G551D. 
And so what, what you're seeing here are, are summary data where you have log ATP concentration on the x-axis against open probability or apparent open probability for F508 Dell or G558D. So this again is low temperature rescued F508 Dell. So as we increase the ATP concentration uh, for, uh, with wild type CFDR, we see this uh, progressive increase in, in channel activity. By contrast, if we if we increase the ATP concentration for either um, for for F508 Dell, we see a small increase, but we but 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 really what we're seeing is a, is a huge reduction in, in the efficacy with which ATP uh, gates CFDR for F5 for for F508 Dell. In the case of uh, G551D, uh, Chung Huang and his colleagues uh, at Missouri uh, had, had earlier demonstrated that um, G551D is all but, uh, 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 its activity is all but independent of that of ATP. So whether we're at a low ATP concentration or the highest ATP concentration tested, the open probability values are essentially the same. And so you have this sort of uh, almost like a linear line uh, as we increase the ATP concentrations for, for G551D. So if we look at F508 Dell, uh, both Ivacafter and CP, as we increase the concentration uh, in the uh, of ATP, we see uh, some enhancement of, uh, of ATP dependence. So we've got some restoration of ATP dependent channel gating to F508 Dell by both potentiators. By contrast, when we look at G551D, we see a very different picture. So, as I've already indicated, uh, for G551D, uh, 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 when we change the ATP concentration, we have very little effect upon uh, channel activity. In the presence of Ivacafter, you see that open probability values increase, uh, and they increase to, by the same extent whether we're at a low ATP concentration or at a high ATP concentration. So what is very interesting in the case of uh, Ivacafter is that it will stimulate or it will potentiate both ATP dependent gating and ATP independent gating, best illustrated by here by the G551D uh, uh, channel. Now, where in the case of the CP compound, as we increase the ATP concentration, what we saw was an increase in, in channel activity. And so this was a really striking result that, that here we're seeing some restoration of ATP dependent gating to G551D by a CFDR potentiator. And as far as I, I, my recollection of the literature, I, we've, we've not seen a potentiator do this to G551D to date. So this is a really exciting result. And it suggests that, uh, that CP has a different mechanism of action to Ivacafta. So to summarize, F508 Dell greatly reduces, and then G551D all but abolishes the ATP dependence of CFDR channel gating. CP and Ivacafta have similar effects on F508 Dell, but they don't restore uh, ATP dependent gating of wild type CFDR. They certainly enhance the ATP dependence, but they don't get back up to the wild type relationship. Ivacafter increases G551D channel activity independent of the ATP con concentration. By contrast, CP restores ATP dependent channel gating to G551D. So these data argue that CP has a different mechanism of action to that of Ivacafter. So we want to understand better uh, how uh, CP uh, affects channel activity. So one characteristic of, of Ivacafter is that it will cause a, 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 it will not only enhance F508 Dell channel activity, but in excised inside out membrane patches and also in polarized epithelia, but I'm, I'm not showing those data today, you will see an acceleration of, of the deactivation of, of F508 Dell at 37 degrees C. So the data shown on the on the left are, are similar to the data that I presented earlier, where, where we when we're using excised inside out membrane patches at 37 degrees C. C, wild type activity is stable, F508 Dell that's been low temperature rescued, we see this loss of channel activity within about six minutes. For F508 Dell, acutely treated with Ivacafter, we see a, a, a marked enhancement of channel activity getting back up to wild type levels, but we see an acceleration of a loss of channel activity. So we were interested to know 
did, what was the effect of the CP compound? Well, we see that we've got an enhancement of channel activity when it's added acutely, uh, and that enhancement lasts uh, a bit longer than that of F508 del, but unfortunately, we don't sort of prevent the deactivation of channels. And so, both in the case of Ivacafter and the case of CP, we're going to need to use the com these, these potentiators in combinations with correctors in order to restore stability to, to F508 del and other, uh, channel, uh, other variants that cause cystic fibrosis. So, to summarize, Low temperature rescued F508 del, unstable at physiological temperatures, and activity lost within 10 minutes. Ivacafter enhances greatly initial channel activity but of F508 del, but then channel activity declines faster compared to its absence. Potentiation of F508 del by CP, more sustained than that of Ivacafter, but CP doesn't prevent the deactivation of F508 del. So the fact that Ivacafter and CP appear to have different mechanisms of action, encouraged us to test uh, combinations of, of Ivacafter and CP on the activity of F508 del and G551D. And so these studies are here are undertaken with uh, uh, Lumacafter or VX809 rescued uh, F508 del, but we saw similar results with low temperature rescued F508 del. And so you've got traces in the presence of either potentiator alone and then the two potentiators together. And what was uh, particularly evident when we had the two potentiators together for G551D is you had this marked enhancement of channel activity. So Tina then quantified these data, and so either for low temperature rescued F508 del or F508 del that's rescued by, by Lumacafter, you see that the combination of the two potentiators doesn't increase uh, open probability greater than either potentiator alone. So we're not seeing co-potentiation of, or, of, or, of uh, F508 del by two potentiators together. By contrast, for G551D, we do see co-potentiation. So the apparent open probability of, uh, of G551D in the presence of, of uh, Ivacafter and CP is, is, gr is statistically greater than either of the potentiators alone. So to conclude then, CP and Ivacafter together do not enhance the activity of F508 del channel activity. So we don't get co-potentiation of F508 del, but we do get co-potentiation of G551D. So potentiation of G551D, uh, but not F508 del, uh, is enhanced by combinations of the two potentiators, CP and Ivacafter, tested at their maximally affected concentration. So in the case of G551D, that's going to be 10 micromolar for both compounds. So in the case of co-potentiation, this is something that's still being sort of actively investigated, but work from Alan Verkman's group uh, has suggested that there's two uh, combinations, uh, at least two classes of, of, of co-potentiators. So one class, class one, would be uh, exemplified by Ivacafter, and we now know that the Ivacafter binds uh, at the membrane spanning domains towards the outside of the channel, uh, and it's a very interesting binding site uh, that where it interacts, so it's both interacting with CFDR and, uh, and at, 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 at the interface of CFDR and the lipid environment. By contrast, the second class of, of potentiators is, is exemplified by, by flavonoids such as apigenin and, gen, uh, apigenin and, and, and genistein, and they interact at the nucleotide binding domain dimer uh, at, at the interface, but it's at a site distinct from the ATP binding pockets. And what's been really interesting recently is that Alexicafter has been demonstrated not only to act as a corrector, but also it acts as a, as a potentiator. And Gergi Lukash and his colleagues with GDO VT in particular have demonstrated that uh, combinations of Ivacafter and Alexicafter co potentiate mutant uh, CFDR. And so a third class of, of co potentiator then would be interacting most likely with, the, with, the, with MBD1. So to, to summarize then, CP has distinct effects compared to Ivacafter, suggesting a different mechanism of action. And so greater clinical benefit might be achieved by combinations of potentiators rather than using a single potentiator such as Ivacafter on its own. So let me show a, a last couple of slides. And so here on the left, 
we have uh, the, the pathway from the, the variants in, in, the, in the cystic fibrosis gene uh, to end-stage lung disease. And on the, on the right, uh, symptomatic therapy, the only therapies available to individuals living with cystic fibrosis before 2012. So the defective gene either causes loss of, of the protein CFDR or altered properties. That's going to lead to altered epithelial ion transport, leading to bronchial obstruction and in the lungs, a loss of host defense mechanisms. So that leads to bacterial infection. And then there's a very intense, long lasting inflammatory response to that infection. And so there is a vicious cycle of infection and inflammation that destroys lung tissue, leading to end-stage lung disease, exemplified bro by bronchiectasis, the permanent dilatation of air passageways. So symptomatic therapy treats the downstream part of this, this pathogenic cascade. And in the case of bronchial obstruction, that's going to be uh, treated by airway clearance. Bronchiectasis would require lung transplant. But since 2012, and in particular since 2019, we now have highly effective CFTR modulators, targeted therapies, targeting the root cause of cystic fibrosis. They are oral pills, so they're treating all affected organs in cystic fibrosis. Finally, I want to emphasize that as a community, the cystic fibrosis uh, uh, community is certainly not finished yet. We still have lots of work to do. And, a, and, a, and an absolutely urgent property is to develop drug therapies for it, the last 10% of individuals. Uh, so these individuals typically have premature termination codon variants. Uh, and in Northern European uh, populations, we're talking about the last 10%. But in other ethnic groups, we're talking about a larger proportion, something like 30 or 40%. So this is an urgent unmet need. But what ultimately we want to do is, is to make CF stand for Cure Found. That's our goal. Thank you very much for your attention. All right, fan fantastic, David. So thanks very much. That's a really, really great presentation. Thank you. So, Thank you. Right. So, so we've got some, yeah, we've got some questions. Well, can I can I start? So you you showed some great data showing the um, you know the efficacy of um, Drakafta. In, you know, in terms of lung function, but what does that mean in terms of clinical efficacy? You know, in other words, is is there is there is greater efficacy needed? You know, if you had combinations with further potentiators. Yeah. Like so a, a, I, I, yeah. Yeah. So we we definitely think that that that, that is the case. So it, what has been very interesting, uh, if you look at the the the, the forced expiratory volume data, um, you. The, the clinical trials with uh, appear to give sort of like about 15% improvement. So, so far, so can we get above 15%? And, you know, that's very much a, a goal. Uh, and uh, we, what has been shown um, uh, experimentally, so not so, so, is that if you use uh, uh, three correctors together so if you if you if you're if you're not only using a, a corrector that is targeting the the interface between the the nucleotide binding domains and the membrane spanning domains but you're also combining that with a lexicafter or, or a similar molecule targeting mbd1 and a, and a molecule targeting mbd2 you can get a better correction so so it, so if we have have say triple uh, correctors uh, potentially with with potentiators as well uh, the the expectation is that you're going to get better correction the the other thing to sort of emphasize i i only showed uh, the fev1 data but in in many respects fev1 is is only part of the the uh, of the picture and the and the almost a a better sort of uh a clinical sort of uh, indicator of the effects of, of, of these therapies is disease stability. So the interval between one exacerbation of, of, of the lung infection requiring intravenous antibiotics and the next uh, uh, exacerbation. And you see that that time period now is greatly increased in the presence of, of, the, of the, the, the CFTR modulators. And as an example, um, 
the, the, this year there is a, a third year uh, student uh, uh, on the neuroscience course, and she she, uh, she tells me that she uh, with cystic fibrosis, and she tells me that she's not needed to take antibiotics since starting a uh, 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 trikafta in 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 2020, and and that that's sort of that's sort of reflected by by other individuals. So so the sort of use of 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 antibiotics for pulmonary exacerbation has greatly uh, uh, decreased yeah okay brilliant and then we had we had another question about the about your 10 percent that you 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 yeah. listed so so all those other variants have they all been characterized are they all similar mechanisms what's so no it's it, it, you know and it's absolutely fascinating um so so one of those uh premature termination codon uh, variants is called W1282X, and it's uh, it, that's the sort of legacy name of it, and and it's common in in Ashkenazi populations of Ashkenazi Jews, um, and what what you see is that the 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 position of the premature termination codon means that you form uh, you you form the two membrane spanning domains, and you form the one of the nucleotide binding domains in the regulatory domain, and so uh, Alan uh, Verkman and his colleagues have shown that if you take that uh, that uh, construct in the laboratory, and you treat it with correctors and potentiators, you can actually boost its its activity. So so one approach would be to sort of com combine therapies like uh, reading through the premature termination codon uh, uh, variant uh, together with. Uh, um, um, drugs that sort of depress uh, nonsense mediated decay and then combine those types of therapies together with potentiators and correctors. Uh, other uh, PTC uh, variants in different positions in the in the gene, they appear, you know, that that one PTC is, is not the same as another PTC. And I think we should have known that because one one processing mutation is certainly not the same as another processing mutation. So so depending upon where you are, you, you're going to need different combinations of to suppress the, the PTC and uh, a and, and nonsense mediated decay. But the, the, the use of the correctors and potentiators is, is going to be very necessary because it, it looks like when you read through a PTC, you don't always substitute the wild type amino acid, and so you might put in a, a, a you might substitute a different amino acid that would have impacts on on folding and function. Yeah, it's it's absolutely fascinating. Yeah, yeah. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. And then then um, yeah, the co comment about um, side effects with trichafta. So. Yes, at some patients stopping treatment. So what's yeah, what, what are your thoughts on that? So, that, so so that so so I don't know the full story there, but but I certainly I'm I I'm, I understand that in, in in some individuals that that um that liver so it's a, it, there are sort of um difficulties with sort of liver uh um liver function tests and and so uh, so the, so Again, this is sort of like uh, one uh, one aspect where we we've sort of investigated uh, CFDR function a lot in the the respiratory airways, uh, the intestine and the pancreas to a certain extent, but but the liver we've not really investigated well enough. And so I think you know going forward we really need to to know you know what does CFDR do in the liver and you know is it all just sort of uh, the production of bile, or or does it have ad ad additional functions in in the biliary system? Um, yeah, you know these things we need to know. So, yeah, and the getting you know the as, as you said, there are other effects of the of the compounds, but but certainly, uh, alexic after tesic after ivac after looks looks better in terms of its safety profile compared to lumic after ivac after, which was the first. Uh, corrector a potentiator combination that was used for for individuals with f508 del yeah okay brilliant and just one um yeah, one final question yeah so just on the cp62006 data just just the just the translation because um you know your excise patches versus epithelia have sort of a different give a yeah. report in different intrinsic efficacy yeah. value so so which one do you translate from how how do you use that yeah. data to make decisions? yeah so that's you know it's a re you know that's a really important point and i think so if we're looking at epithelia you know ultimately we're going to be looking at epithelia uh 
and and so there CFTR is not work, you know, it's not like studying CFTR in an excised inside out membrane patch where we're just, just directly applying the, the, the drug to the inside of the membrane. Uh, in, the, in a polarized epithelia, we've got CFTR working together with other ion channels and transporters. We've got uh, uh, networks of interacting proteins and we've got signaling pathways. And so differences in phosphorylation status in the epithelia versus the excised patches, differences in, in the in the interacting uh, in the in the fact that you've got uh, an epithelium rather than a, a single channel and I think that those are the sorts of explanations and and you know and it's one of the reasons why we always have we always really need to go back to the epithelium uh, and not just do everything at the level of excised membrane patches it's you know it's a very very solitary solitary lesson yeah right thank fantastic. you Andy. right great yeah. stuff well, apologies to people if I haven't um, um, posed their questions, but yeah, great questions and yeah, thanks very much, David. Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you. So thank you very much, everybody, for attending the webinar. Thank you, David, for an absolutely wonderful presentation. Um, I think everyone will agree that we've learned a lot. Um, that was certainly amazingly interesting, and it's very exciting to hear the developments within yeah. uh, within your field. So thank you yeah. so much for sharing everything with us. Um, yeah, everyone, th thank you for your attending. Um, hopefully see you at the next webinar in February. And I know it's only November, but hopefully it's it's nearly the end of the month. It's not too early to say. I hope everybody has a lovely Christmas. <laughs> um, and yeah, looking forward to catching up again, again in the new year at the next webinar. Mm -hmm.